Hello, good evening everyone and a warm welcome to BIC Streams. Today's session is KGF Files, Past, Present and Future. I have to warn you, if any of you are here with the expectation of seeing Yash or any cars exploding in slow motion, Hold on, we have our very own Bijapur boy, Basav Biradar and Bangalore girl, Aliye Rizvi, who I promise are no less than any filmy celebrity in weaving stories and making us root for the past. The full bios of the speakers will appear in the chat box on the right side. And if you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And with that, over to you, Basav. Uh, thank you, Leka. Hello, hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, so I think uh, what we thought we will do is we'll start with a small presentation from me and then we will have a conversation with Aliyeh and me. And then we'll open it up for Q&A. So uh, I'm going to share my screen as I speak through. So uh, I think the, the uh, idea of this session was to talk about Kola gold fields uh, from different perspectives, not only from the mining perspective. Um, so hence, we, uh, hence I thought it would be interesting to look at uh, different angles and different kind of cultures, subcultures, and heritage which is there in Kolar, right? uh, KGF, right? Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, KGF is about uh, 80 to 90, located about 80 to 90 kilometers approximately from Bangalore um, uh, to the east. And... Uh, to begin with, uh, Kola, go, go, it, historically, if we look at it, uh, the region has always been known as uh, it's rocky and it, it has always been suspected that it has it had gold, right? So uh, although we don't have any written proven uh, historical records to say that there was gold mining in this region before uh, uh, the British uh, started it, um, but there are uh, some uh, uh, you know accounts which say that there were attempts by, say, for example, Tipu Sultan, and there was also mining done uh, much earlier, thousands of years earlier in, the, in this region. But what we are going to look at today is uh, the modern mining, the, the history of modern mining, which took place in KGF, and also what the, this mining led to, in a way, right? So uh, one of the beginning records that we have is uh, this, you know, the one that you're seeing at screen. This is a letter written by uh, John Warren, he was a military person in uh, East India Company. Uh, and he, in 1803, like he writes here, when he was doing a survey in the Kolar region, he found that the locals used to do, uh, uh, locals where uh, he heard rumors that the locals would, you know, mine gold uh, here, right? When he says that, uh, it probably means surface mining, which is done probably up to two to three feet uh, from uh, the ground level, right? Not deeper than that. So that was the first instance of observations uh, made by uh, someone on the golden ore found in this region, right? And this was published in Asiatic Journal, but nothing much happened uh, after that. It was there as a record, but uh, nobody really took interest in it. Uh, but uh, because of their success elsewhere, you know, because of their success elsewhere, a number of colonial uh, you know, officers who were working in uh, this region um, started to uh, think of gold mining in this region, right? And uh, one of the early persons or the, uh, the first person to actually uh, sign a lease, uh, buy a lease of land there for gold mining was Michael Lavelle. And Ma Michael Lavelle, as many of us would know, uh, is after whom Lavelle Road in Bangalore is uh, named, right? So Michael Lavelle in about 1873, uh, bought a lease from the Mysore Maharaja saying that, you know, I'm going to attempt gold mining. Uh, so he bought a block of land in KGF area and then he, uh, he tried mining, but he soon realized that, uh, you know, mining needs a lot more money, a lot more investment uh, to bring the equipment, etc. And to be able to hire workers uh, to be able to mine, uh, right? Mine systematically, that is. So uh, then what he did was he just sold his lease. So this continued up to 1880s, right? So, and eventually in 1880, when the leases, uh, uh, when the British uh, military officers who owned the leases by then, uh, mostly of, most of them were from Madras uh, or were stationed in Madras, 
they uh, decided to uh, dip into the history of gold uh, history of mining in uh, in cornwall in uk right so they hired uh, a company called john taylor and sons to come and uh, uh, you know operationalize these mines in kolar so that is the first first time when systematic mining began and in um, and the john taylor and sons came here and they established uh, uh, you know the mining operations, and they also struggled for a while. But eventually, they hit uh, what is called in technical terms a load, a champion load. It's named, and then gold was there, and it was unbelievable amount of gold. Of course, there was a lot of struggle, and these were. Uh, this is also interesting because this is also an instance of a colonial capitalist venture in the sense that the money was raised through investors in england so this company the gold mining company was essentially owned by shareholders who were uh, who were in the uk so very much a modern idea of company and capital right so they, the capital came from uk uh, it was operationalized and run by john taylor and sons uh, so they uh, so they operationalized the mine so of course to operationalize mines they needed a lot of workers right so a lot of labor was available a lot of labor had to be done and uh, as many of would, many of you would know um, gold mining is a very labor intensive process the ore has to be excavated from um, the earth uh, under the earth and brought up and then processed crushed brought up uh, crushed processed and then the gold is found in it right so there is a labor intensive process so for all this they had to hire people, right? And at that time, the inhabitation, uh, sorry, the habitation around Kola region was made mostly in you know, a small villages, uh, right? So they did not have uh, adequate uh, workers. So what they did was, uh, due to their reach in Madras presidency, uh, they hired many contractors who could bring them workers, right? So the, so most of the workers, uh, incidentally, came from. Uh, the North uh, Arcot region and Salem uh, and Andhra Pradesh uh, or then Andhra Pradesh. So Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, uh, so parts of Madras presidency, right? It's very interesting because that also tells us that uh, most of the Karnat or Mysore state people were not, not really um, interested or not really willing to do such a hard labor as, uh, you know, mining. Uh, probably because uh, Mysore state was much more self-sufficient. The people were much more, uh, uh, you know, um, they had other means of making a living. But many of these people who came from the drier regions of uh, Tamil Nadu and Nadu Pradesh, which was part of Madras residency, that's them, were uh, mostly farm laborers, you know, peasants who worked in farms of, uh, of land holdings, landholders, right? So zamindars, etc. So, so they were the ones, so it, it kind of created a good, very interesting labor composition, right? So uh, once the champion load was identified, capital was there and the labor was hired, the mines stuff were operational and they started producing really high amount of uh, money. One context to also think of it is um, uh, at that time, the, just for, uh, uh, as you go further, hold this thought, which is, 1881 is one when the you know direct rule of British was over. So 1881 was when uh, Mysore state was uh, given back or handed back. The administration was handed back to Wadayars. So it was just in the decay of after Wadayars came back to power that the gold mines of KGF started. Uh, so. Right. So if we talk of labor composition, as I talked about, it is very interesting. Many of colonial ventures at that time uh, you would see were similar. They had uh, uh, there were colonial theories of which community people are good for what kind of work uh, in India, right, amongst the Indians. So, so there were different kind of uh, reasons why certain community people were hired. For example, uh, people from Malabar, uh, carpenters from Malabar were hired because they're very good. Uh, so, so Malayalis from Malabar were hired as carpenters for woodworks, essentially. Uh, then there were uh, people from Punjab hired, Punjab region, uh, both Muslims and Sikhs were hired because they were considered a martial race and good as security people and mines being about gold, etc. So they wanted uh, substantial security to be established. So these were Punjabis were hired. 
Uh, when it came to the unskilled, of course, like we spoke about, the, the Tamil and Telugu people were hired. Um, when I say unskilled, I mean, you know, uh, carrying uh, mud, uh, you know, ex uh, and, uh, you know, mean, uh, jobs which don't need any essential prerequisite skills, right? Uh, there were also a number of Anglo-Indians hired, right? So Anglo-Indians were hired. Uh, uh, obviously, one great skill uh, available for to them was they could speak English, uh, which you know could uh, which allowed them to be the mediators between the uh, you know sort of uh, workers and the European owners. So they formed the middle management layer, what we call today, right? So supervisors, foremen, etc. Right? Um, interestingly, there were also women and children who worked in the mines back then, uh, or more, or, but mostly on the surface, not uh, underground. Um, so this was the labor composition and how recruitment was made. And of course, officers were all Europeans. Uh, there were some Italians uh, for in the initial decades hired because they were very experienced with how to uh, blast rock. Uh, uh, and so the, their techniques were required. And uh, many experienced mining engineers came from Cornwall, called the Cornish miners, what we call from Britain from Cornwall region in Britain. So this was the labor composition. So immediately we get a feel of how um, the region, um, a unique place was created because there were so many different kinds of people coming to work in one place, right? Um, if you look at early years, uh, those were the golden years. Um, so in the early decades, of course, till 1890s, it was a bit slow, but later on, it started to, uh, you know, be really profitable, um, and uh, it was profitable because the what we call as the grade of the ore was high. Grade of the ore means how much gold can you extract in a ton of ore, right? So uh, it was very rich. So, um, like for like I, like I've written mentioned here uh, about fifteen more than fifteen tons were uh, fifteen tons gold was mined only in the year 1905, which is the highest ever in the history of Kola gold fields in a year, right? So, and by 1943, as per, uh, you know, one of the reports of that time, um, by 1943, almost 545 uh, tons of gold was mined uh, from these. And, and it probably uh, would have, you know, to, in today's uh, calculations, it would be more than 50 billion euros, right? Um, so there was, uh, 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 because uh, the early decades were profitable, early decades also had high employment. So the peak employment was about, uh, you know, more than 35,000 people working in this uh, Kola gold fields in 1905, um, right? Uh, and also initially, although there were many, uh, many um, leases, which means many companies, they were consolidated, all the holdings were consolidated into five chief uh, companies and uh, later only four. So mainly Mysore, Champion, Nandi, Drug, and Urgaon are which you can still see, right? But there are others like Balaghat, Koramandal, et cetera, which we no longer, uh, which soon uh, uh, ran out of the resource, right? So, so this is how early years were there. And of course this meant that, you know, the Europeans had to come and live there. They had to make a life, uh, which meant that uh, they needed, the infrastructure was needed. So townships were built, right? So the, the, one of the direct uh, result of this mines was townships, right? So there were, um, one township was built on the, as, as Robertson paid, it was named after the resident of Mysore who was Donald Robertson uh, in 1904, I think. And then immediately after a few years, Anderson Pate was built. And then also later, Bowring Pate was built, uh, which was named after, uh, uh, the commissioner of Mysore at Bowring, right, Lewis Bowring. So these townships were built. And what does this township mean? Township meant market, township meant housing, uh, you know, uh, schools, hospitals. Uh, so all these infrastructure were built, right? But apart from the township, the mines itself needed some basic uh, infrastructure because um, working in mines was hard without electricity. The productivity was uh, less. Uh, initially, the miners used to use candles and go down, right? So it was not efficient enough. So because of their good relations with Mysore state, and of course, it, they were also paying Mysore state uh, royalty every year. So 
the British influence or the uh, company owners influenced uh, the Mysore state to build a hydroelectricity plant, which became the first hydroelectricity plant in Asia at that time, right? So it was uh, built in Shivan Samudra, which is a uh, uh, waterfalls of Kaveri. Um, but uh, the, the problem with building it there was that it was almost about more than 200 kilometers away from KGF, the mines, right? So it was not an uh, easy task. So they hired General Electric, the American company, to come and actually put the, uh, the wiring and the electricity was transferred from Shivana Samudra to uh, the mines in Kola Gold Fields. And that uh, became historic, as you all know. And of course, because there was excess electricity produced, it was also given to Bangalore. And Bangalore became one of the first cities in Asia to have street lights. So, so on and so forth, right? So electricity was that. There was also water supply needed. So a man-made lake was built. Um, so just, okay, sorry. Oh yeah, man-made man lake was built uh, in Bethamangalam, which is about 13 kilometers from Kola Gold Fields. This is a recent photograph that I took. Uh, it's still there and it's very interesting because it's a very um, old, uh, interesting colonial building. Um, if you go inside, like you'll see, you know, uh, there's a filter filtration plant and you have, uh, as you can see, the signage from that time of Mysore, uh, Ganda Virunda there. And uh, it's, you can see, um, even you see this, uh, the filtration plant is here in this picture, you'll see. So this, it's massive and it is still there. It, uh, of course, no longer provides uh, water to Kola Gold Fields, but to Betamangalam itself, which is a small village now. Right, and the, this is the um, um, the plop there, you know, which uh, tells us about how um, Krishna Javadia IV uh, commissioned it, right? And in 1903, it was completed in 1904, right? Um, and the lake, uh, when I went, it was dry, but I'm told in monsoon, it usually fills it up. So this is how it looks, right? Um, and of course, they built hospitals, uh, because miners, of course, uh, uh, sicknesses were common in those times. There was more epidemics than now. And then uh, also injuries in mines, right? So KGF hospital was built. But interestingly, the hospital was initially only for Europeans, right? So uh, it was only for Europeans, only later, much later in 1940s, due to the um, workers' demands, it was opened up for others. But it was initially only for uh, Europeans and Anglo-Indians, uh, right? So officer level people essentially. And it was known to be, uh, I mean, it became one of the uh, uh, most equipped, well-equipped hospital in the region in the Mysore uh, state at that time. And that was very interesting. It had more than 100 beds. Um, and many people from KGF who were born in this hospital will talk about how good it was. Uh, Today, this is how it looks, the facade of the hospital. And uh, of course, it's uh, abandoned today. So if you go inside, you will see still signage of injection room and wards named after uh, British uh, officials of the mines uh, and the beds. Uh, this is a photograph we took inside, right? And of course, train was required because you need to transport the uh, war, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, in the output of the mines. So the already Madras mail existed by then and it was extended from Bangalore to Bangar Pe, uh, Boring Pate, which is, which is now called Bangar Pate. It was Boring Pate earlier. Um, and uh, yeah, and Bangar, from Bangar Pate, uh, it's also now extended all the way to each of the mines, Urgam. Uh, Urgam is one of the mines that we saw in the first uh, slides, right? Um, we, let's talk a little bit about the working conditions. Like I said, uh, one of the uh, initial, uh, it was tough working conditions, of course. Most of the employees uh, um, um, were hired through contractors uh, while most of them were employees. There were also a large number of people who were employed, as, uh, employed by the contractors. So they were temporary employees as far as the company went. went company had a tie up with the contractor, right? And usually they worked in three shifts of eight hours each. Um, I mean, they would only work one shift, but uh, eight, there were three shifts also all around the clock, right? Uh, and of course, because in the early days there was no electricity and no cooling, air cooling, so it was very, very 
uh, difficult to work. The temperatures went to more than 50 degrees centigrade uh, underneath uh, in, the, in the mines. Um, the wages were low. Uh, there was no real regulations at that time. Um, and that is very interesting and that's something we'll talk about further uh, and no real benefits as well. So there were, there, it was a little dangerous, which also meant that there were a lot of accidents, which meant there were a lot of deaths. Uh, accidents were mainly due to, uh, you know, uh, bursts, the rock bursts, what are called as rock, rock bursts or stone blasts, uh, stone blasts, the different names for them, but rock burst is probably the technical name. And then um, because of that, and sometimes they would fall into a shaft uh, by mistake or because of lack of, uh, you know, power or, uh, lack of enough sufficient light. Uh, so this, uh, there were a lot of number of basically physical dangers for miners to work uh, underground, right? And most of the miners who worked underground were Indians, right? While the officials would come and go, but the miners who actually physically worked underground were Indians, right? And so there were tough working conditions and the way it was state, uh, the way it was set up uh, between the Mysore state, of course, the land was owned by Mysore state, so it was leased out to these companies. The way it was, uh, the way the deal was set up was that the royalty of 5% was paid to Mysore state every year. And that was um, very lucrative at that point and necessary for Mysore state because once the direct rule of British had ended, um, Mysore state also had to pay a yearly um, yearly subsidiary yearly charges to uh, the British, right? So, uh, and that was, I think, more than 30 lakhs per year. So, this, uh, the royalty that came out of the mines was really helping them with that, right? So, it was a crucial, it became a very important source of uh, revenue, right? But as soon as they realized that the gold output is really good, the Mysore state increase the, in addition to the royalty, they also levied a certain amount of duty, which was based on the price difference of um, the gold, which was sold in UK or in Europe. Um, the price of uh, the selling price and the cost price, the difference between that, uh, based on that, the duty was levied. Um, also, interestingly, John Taylor and Sons had a representation in the assembly of Mysore state, Mysore princely state, so they were sort of uh, part uh, of the machinery of state and well aware of what was going on as far as regulations and laws were concerned. Although Mysore Mines Act was passed in 1906 uh, by the state, um, it, it, it was really, uh, you know, uh, led by uh, or dictated by how John Taylor and Sons wanted the act to be uh, written or uh, passed, right? So, uh, and in this, uh, uh, in this act, uh, for example, there was no workers' compensation uh, for injuries and this one. So most of the times, uh, what would happen is if workers were injured and if they were not employees uh, or if they fell sick, the companies would just uh, send them back to their villages with a one-way ticket, right? So, uh, so it was a little uh, difficult, uh, very difficult for workers at that time. Uh, with no regulations, right? Workers' Compensation Act came much later in 1928. Um, working in mines also meant uh, the dust, the people under working underground would inhale the dust of the uh, work, the dust, and the dust caused a disease called miners' thysis, popularly known as miners' thysis. Uh, and that disease was initially not uh, considered as something to be compensated for by the company. And it took a long time and only in 1928 when the Workers' Compensation Act was passed, uh, this uh, was, disease was recognized as occupational hazard and for it, workers should be compensated, right? So, so there was a significant, essentially, um, there was a significant role of Mysore state in how uh, mines uh, were run from the beginning, but initially most uh, until 19... 30, there was no real uh, evaluation of the working conditions of workers uh, in mines by the state. All they had was they had a chief inspector of mines appointed and the job of chief inspector of mines was to um, prepare a report every year, annual report and uh, submit it to the so Mysore state. Uh, and in, uh, and uh, until 1930, there was no investigation. As I said, 1930 was when the first time somebody from Mysore state was sent to investigate the labor conditions uh, in the Kola gold fields, Kola gold mines and prepare a report. 
And that report even today is a very helpful uh, document for us to study how uh, the conditions were. Right? Uh, also the Trade Union Act, although uh, I think if you've seen the film, you would have uh, seen uh, uh, Professor Janki Nair talking about it. Uh, most of her work has been around uh, uh, the workers' conditions and uh, the, the legal uh, aid, uh, the, the legal aspects of it in KGF and uh, really fantastic work. Uh, and that, uh, as she says, the Trade Union Act wasn't passed in Mysore State till 1942. Um, and uh, whereas in the rest of the country, rest of British India, it was already passed in 1920s, I think 28. So that also had an effect, which means that workers could not organize themselves and demand for better conditions, better wages, living conditions, etc. Right. Um, moving forward, so uh, I'm going to quickly run through some of the other aspects. So in addition to train, there are also these, you know, infrastructure like which we get to see now, like this wonderful, beautiful post office in Urgaon. Uh, each mine, each mining company had a post office. Uh, its own post office and uh, you know facilities uh, and recreational facilities as well. You see this lovely pin code list which is still there inside the post office. Um, housing also, of course, a, a primary requirement was also housing because the Europeans who were coming here to uh, make a living, work in the mines, needed housing, and the workers who were natives also needed a uh, also needed. Uh, housing, right? So, uh, but it's, uh, you know, if we look at it, like this photograph is actually of one of the, you know, uh, uh, an attempt to show how the initial workers' houses were. It's, it's just one room, like a, uh, you know, um, Tati house, what they call uh, in Tamil, was it, it was a Tati house, right? Or bamboo it was. Of course, this one has a little bit more than bamboo. Uh, so, uh, if the bamboo huts were built, basically, for workers, uh, and, uh, but for, uh, British, they were bungalows, right? And this, you know, some inhabitation we see in these uh, structures also even today, but these were actually at that time uh, police stations, right? This is how a worker's uh, housing looks like. There are still people living there. Uh, these, were, these were called as lines or blocks. Uh, the workers were uh, put in, uh, you know, housed in uh, small uh, huts like this in lines or blocks. And, but this housing for workers was insufficient, as in it was not as many as the workers were there. And also because workers had large families, they were coming from, uh, they were all, they were most of the 90% or more than 50% of the workers in uh, mining workers, unskilled workers especially, belonged to uh, depressed classes, right? So uh, lower castes and depressed classes uh, of Tamil, uh, Tamil speaking and Telugu speaking which meant that they had a large family also to support. Uh, so in one room, you would find you know, many people living in a family. So there were difficult housing conditions. But in contrast, uh, the Europeans had uh, you know, uh, uh, lavish bungalows built for them. They had uh, also, they had uh, all kinds of servants, butlers, uh, you know, uh, and somebody to uh, do the sanitation work every day uh, and cleaning, et cetera. So there was, uh, the contrast between the two is really stark if you go to KGF even today, right? So these are, this is actually a recent photograph of a bungalow. Uh, and there are many of these in KGF. So this was this idea of, uh, uh, or discrimination or segregation, you call it, was very, very prominent uh, in that time, in uh, pre-independence time. Uh, they also built schools, of course. Uh, so like Kola Goldfields, many uh, Kola Goldfield schools. Many would have read about, read about uh, how the alumni is supporting it now to keep it going because it was running out of funds uh, because of the state not doing much about it. So uh, there were also other schools like St. Joseph's, uh, etc., which were built for. Uh, so the township basically led to uh, the township included the schools as well, right? Uh, and of course, recreation. So this is a KGF club which was built in 1898. Uh, of course, for many years, only Europeans were allowed in this club. Uh, but post-independence, uh, I think only 1950s, post-1950s, Indians also were allowed uh, into the club. Right? And if you go inside the club, this, you know, uh, this, uh, the, uh, I mean, of course, nothing much, uh, no renovation or uh, any alteration has been done 
since uh, its inception. So you get to see as it was probably in those times, right? This is the bar inside. Uh, this is another uh, uh, recreation facility called King George Hall. Uh, now it is renamed as KGF Post Cosmopolitan Club. It is interesting that King George Hall was built in 1911 as a tribute to King George uh, uh, or the occasion of King George's coronation, which was happening in Delhi, the Delhi Darbar, uh, which most of us would remember as because there is still footage of, you know, video footage of Delhi Darbar of 1911, where all the princely states kings were called for the coronation of King George in Delhi. Uh, during that time, uh, um, King George Hall was built here. Yeah, it's there in the film in one of the shots, I think. Um, now it's, a, of course, a, cos a club, recreation club, and members play badminton. It's also used for weddings, functions, etc. There's a lovely snooker and billiards uh, facility with equipment from those times. Uh, of course, there was the religion played a huge role uh, in KGF. Uh, so there was a number of churches built, uh, mostly Wesleyan to begin with. Then there were also Catholic uh, um, uh, churches. Uh, so this is St. Teresa's, which is in Robertson Pate. Um, uh, and it's, uh, it, it, it's a Wesleyan church, right? Uh, and uh, of course, there were also uh, churches within the line. So this is in Marikupam, which is under Mysore Mines. Uh, so it is within the workers' uh, uh, residential area. Right, so it's, uh, it's this was built in 1885. So religion played a huge role, and very interestingly, religion in KGF is also uh, uh, unique in the sense that uh, you'll see many people. Uh, uh, you know, some shrines are considered the shrine, like Mother of Mines, a shrine in KGF is you know she's considered the Mother of Mines. So everybody worships her. It doesn't matter whether you're Christian or not, right? So such kind of uh, uh, you know, very unique uh, religious culture came about. Like I wanted to put this photograph just to show this is uh, Mr. Sami Pillai, who actually um, expired just a month ago uh, in KGF. He was 80 plus. Um, and uh, he, if you see behind him, you'll see you know, there are different faith uh, photographs of gods of different faith in his house, uh, which is very interesting. He was, uh, he worked as a, um, you know, unskilled labor in the mines uh, for many years for more than 30 years. Uh, this is uh, Neelamma. We met her in the, uh, in the mining area, uh, in, the, in the residential area of the Mysore mines. She's about 83, she told us, and that she had, uh, her father was a butler in uh, one of the Anglo-Indian houses. Uh, uh, that's the job he did. So yeah, that's how she is in the mines, yeah. Right, so also KGF uh, um, is, is, is full of very, very particular uh, histories, you know, very uh, much to research and, you know, it will intrigue any aspect, um, uh, any aspect could be intriguing for anyone. So, for example, uh, because of the you know, huge number of workers and uh, the tough working conditions, uh, it was uh, the trade union movement and the workers movement here uh, really had a, uh, uh, really lasted for a long time. It's, I mean, it's still very active. Um, then there was also self-respect movement. Self-respect movement is the movement uh, mostly which emerged in uh, South India and especially in Tamil Nadu where um, the, uh, the depressed classes fought against uh, representation or discrimination uh, based on caste. Uh, and, uh, you know, so you'll see a lot of self-respect uh, effects, after effects of self-respect movement in KGF. Um, and of course, Buddhist movement in this, uh, the Buddhist, the first Buddha Vihar here was built in 1905 or 1907, which is much earlier than all the, uh, uh, the Ambedkar uh, conversion to Buddhism, etc., which comes in 1920s. So you, there are about two to three Buddha Vihars in uh, KGF. Uh, and the conversion had started at that time itself uh, as a result of the self-respect movement. Um, and there is, of course, because of the uh, huge population of uh, depressed classes, the politics has always uh, been led uh, by, uh, uh, you know, um, the discourse has always been about the late discrimination. And, you know, even Scheduled Caste Federation, a party which existed in KGF, is now 
uh, RPI, renamed as RPI, Republic Party of India, is also active there. There was DMK because of the Tamil speaking population. So it's a very unique in the state of Karnataka if you look at it. Uh, and of course, Tamil linguistic movement comes because it was um, in 1980s when, uh, uh, you know, Mr. Gundura was the chief minister of Karnataka. There was, uh, and the Gokak movement emerged to make uh, Kannada language as the primary language in schools. Uh, the people who were Tamil speaking in, uh, people who were largely Tamil speaking in KGF fought against it and they protested. There were also police firing and, uh, you know, so there is, uh, that history also, and of course, there is Anglo-Indian history, which has been written in a wonderful book by Bridget White uh, uh, called Memories of KGF, right? Um, and yeah, so this is the photo of Frank Pillai's house. There's also Mother Teresa and all of this. This is the Buddha Vihar I was talking about. This was a very interesting document I found while looking at uh, some of the, you know, uh, the person who's in charge of uh, Mr. Dev Kumar showed me this is to how a person wrote a letter, uh, which probably is very, um, if someone does this today, it will be uh, maybe a sensational news. He says, dear sir, I wish to write you that I was a Christian of the above church and was baptized between June 40 and 41. Since my activities were diverted in a different way and I took to the service of the society in a communal basis and I left Christianity years back. Hence, I request you to kindly withdraw my family from the church, from Christianity. Send me a certificate as to this effect. So it is very, uh, I found this really interesting. So I thought I'd show it to you guys. Uh, the magazine Tamilian uh, was a very influential in the self-respect movement, as I said. So, and it was also uh, read here widely, uh, supplied and read here widely. Uh, that's Periyar. Um, uh, so interesting signage in KGF. You'll find a lot of Ambedkar, Periyar. Um, um, so this is Periyar in one of the mining residential area, Periyar's uh, painting. Uh, this is Mr. Tangarasan. He was, he actively was participated in the, the linguistic movement I spoke about. They went all the way to meet Indira Gandhi to protest against the Karnataka government's ruling of primary language as Canada and their right to study in uh, their mother tongue, which is Tamil. Um, and he works today in the KGF Cosmopolitan Club as a manager. Uh, this I wanted to just show that how uh, uh, this is a notice from the strikes uh, in 1940s. These the different so domestic servants, the workers in mines and domestic servants, so butlers, cleaners, etc., sanitation workers, came together to uh, you know uh, demand, submit uh, you know demands to the mining companies, and uh, so yeah like this notification is of that strike. So the trade union uh, was huge uh, for a long time led by the Communist Party of India. Um, there were very famous strike again studied extensively and written by Jan Nair, the 1930 strike and then the 1946 strike. Uh, uh, and hence this uh, political scenario also led to multiple trade unions. And these are the local Communist Party leaders who are still considered icons and there are huge paintings of them that you'll see there. On the left is VM Goindan, TS Money in the center, and then on the right of your screen is KS Vasan. Right, uh, these, I just wanted to share this before we open up. Uh, uh, I think I've taken too much time. So there's also this symmetries. One is a, it's called Roger Camp where, you know, coming, it's also called the Communist Party Cemetery. That's a certain area in this, which is occupied by the graves of Communist Party people who died as part of the struggle. Uh, and then uh, it is very uniquely, it is also um, multi-religious. Uh, so. It's, you'll see Vaishnava graves here and you'll see, uh, I mean, you'll see different uh, religious, uh, different people of diff different religion buried here and their graves, so, which is uh, very unlikely that we'll find anywhere else in India. Um, the other cemetery, called, I call it Tale of Two Cemeteries. The other cemetery is unfortunately abandoned today, but you'll still find these stones if you go looking for them. These are the, the where the British or the, or the colonial people who lived here and died were buried. Uh, yeah, yeah post-independent story, uh, as uh, you might have seen in the film, because gold is a diminishing resource, uh, um, it did not become, it was not viable anymore, and eventually uh, the mines had to be shut down. Right? 
so, uh, and Bharat Gold Mines is the company which was formed after independence to operate these mines. Right. And this is the waste rock. Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, Aliya, can we open up? Maybe we can talk about the rest as part of the conversation. Yes, I can hear. Hi, Pasav, and uh, I want to thank you and the BIC for inviting me to this um, conversation. And um, I just want to say that uh, <clears throat> your evocative film, In Search of Gold, was very meaningful for me because I grew up in a heavy engineering township called Shahabad in uh, North Karnataka that later became a ghost town, much like this one. The insular colony life that I was exposed to set in the middle of nowhere gave me much a uh, sense of safety and protection because it was very close, a vibrant socio-cultural environment. There was clubs, there was cosmopolitanism, people from all across uh, India. Also a respect for reading. There was not much there to do. Um, diversity and the value of very close relationships. Yeah. And that ran alongside the power hierarchies that came from the factory. So people that uh, my parents, uh, my father worked with uh, were people we socialized with and we all the children went to school together. So I understand from my experience that townships like this, like KGF, very similar, um, were literally the live work spaces for its people. They have a culture that is very, very distinct from both village and city life. So I'm curious to know more from you about KGF. Uh, what was the place like in its uh, in its time? Um, you know, and what you gathered from your interviewees regarding the mood of the place um, at its best. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Uh, I mean, and uh, the, one of the curiosity for me to go and do something or research more or look and read about and visit KGF was that there were so many people I met who would say, oh, KGF, you know, immediately, you know, their antennas go up and they are like, yeah, KGF was so amazing, et cetera, et cetera. And so many English speaking, especially English speaking, well-to-do, uh, prosperous people, right? So that intrigued me to see what, uh, uh, what this place is about. So because I think the township is, uh, you know, like, we, uh, like you spoke about, is a very this constrained area in one place and it's, and because people come for work, it ends up being a very diverse, culturally diverse place because many people from different backgrounds come and live there, which means their children get to you know, play with children of different cultures. And so it, it's very cosmopolitan is the feeling I've got from what I've spoken to many people from KGF, even, if, uh, even, even though, uh, of course, there is segregation and of course there are people uh, who could not go to the schools that uh, children of officers could go to. But still the culturally, I think even now, like if you go to KGF, many people will tell you that KGF is, KGF uh, children always had, uh, always spoke English. They were, you know, they're uh, much more well, better educated than people elsewhere is their claim, right? So it's very kind of very unique. So the township, at its peak had, you know, each mine had its own uh, recreation club at different levels. And the, uh, you know, workers also had their own, uh, you know, uh, uh, entertainment. There were movie theaters and there was even KGF's own beer at one point, right? So, so it was, it's a very unique uh, and own soda also, right? So, so it was very, so a lot of such uh, um, aspects which uh, branded it as cosmopolitan, I would say. Uh, also not forget, uh, although not forgetting the point that there was a, a, a huge class of people who were underprivileged. Yeah. Yeah. So um, my, my work in placemaking uses memories and stories primarily as tools to connect people to place. Yes. So when I see, uh, when I look at KGF, I don't see a point on a map. I see this web of invisible lines, stories that crisscross, circle around, join many dots, yeah. uh, and point to very deep connections with Bangalore, which is my area of focus. But sadly, there aren't many opportunities where these connections um, between KGF and Bangalore 
Bengaluru are made visible. These stories therefore sit on the periphery of our minds and our memories. So you spoke earlier about Michael Lavelle, for instance, and mentioned that Lavelle Road is named after him. Yeah. Um, I always think about that when I when I you know go down that road, and um, he's credited, as we know, with recognizing the business potential of the mines in the 1800s. And his connection to KGF is also his home on Lavelle Road, the Urgam House, yeah. which he calls the first shaft that he sang at KGF. Yeah. So the memories linger. More connections to KGF are also found for me outside the State Central Library in Kabun Park, where the statue of Divan Sir Sheshadri yeah. Ayer stands. Many newcomers to the city don't even remember, you know, the contributions of the Divans to the development of Mysore State at one point in time. Yeah. And we know that he was instrumental in granting concessions to the mining syndicate to, be to begin operations in the late 1870s. Yeah. Then the, um, for me, there's Sir Donald Robertson, um, Robertson Road in Fraser Town, of course, Robertson Pate. Yeah. He was closely involved with Divan Sir Seshadri Ayer to sanction these operations. And uh, he even worked closely with John Taylor Company and Sons in England after his retirement. He was also the president of the Bangalore Club from 1897 to 1898. Then there are prominent businessmen, city businessmen, you know, from the Mudalyar community as well yeah. as Kachi Mehman community who were very closely invested in that area. So yeah. just today I got this, uh, a friend sent me this uh, write-up about Haji Sir Ismail Seth and his investment yeah. in KGF. Yeah. So there are, who are, as we can see, connected, you know, very closely um, to the place. But one of the stories I just wanted to share and discuss a little more with you is the story that I came across when I was researching a piece on the Buddha Bihar in Cockstown. Yeah. And um, it was a very fascinating story that uh, took me from Roy Petta in Chennai, Thousand Lights actually, to Sri Lanka with the Tamil intellectual and anti-caste activist named Ayuthi Das. Um, I I think he was born uh, and lived between 1845 to 1914, who in the late 1800s, I think a time when, you know, the social reform movements and all were sweeping the country, uh, was introduced by, now again, another connection, uh, the plot thickens, so to speak, by Henry Olcott of the Theosophical yeah. Society. And he was taken to Sri Lanka and introduced to a very powerful Sinhalese monk called Anagarika Dharmapala. Ayuthi came back from Sri Lanka as a Buddhist and set up a press in Roipetta where he wrote and printed Sakya Buddhist literature and founded the first Buddha Vihar there in the late 1800s. So the connection between the Sinhalese monks and the Buddha Vihar were integral to the history of the Buddhist revival in South India, as we know, and all the movements that would follow. You've mentioned a lot of them in the presentation. The Buddha Vihar came up in Cockstown in 1907, and then in 1927, uh, a Sakya Buddhist society was established in Marikupam and Champion Reefs, yeah. uh, KGF. And a large number of the Tamil miners here were, who were predominantly Adi Dravida yes. um, and other depressed classes, uh, it, it was for them. Now, for me, the Bangalore connection that came about in this story was the Bangalore East Station and the Buddha Vihar in Cockstown. So trains from KGF would stop at the Bangalore East Station. And um, I would like to think that the miners um, were on those trains also maybe coming to the Buddha yeah. Vihar in Bangalore. So... Um, Perhaps the proximity of the Buddha Vihar, the choice of the location was because these trains were coming in to Bangalore. I'm curious to know why they didn't get down at the cantonment station and why this little Bangalore East station was built specifically for them before the Can station, which was a big colonial station. And a little more about their social realities at the time. Yeah, that's a great question and great connection you're making, Ali. Um, I think I mean, with respect to their lives, I mean... Um, it's it's uh, it's appalling sometimes to read how uh, uh, the housing infrastructure, where, for example, plague was a big problem, uh, as we all know, in the late 19th century and also in early 20th century in Bangalore and Kolar and KGF, etc. Right? 
so during plague for example one of the you know they were always the dipper class were always blamed that because their housings are not clean etc they they are uh, the british had this idea that the plague begins there so they would they actually set up a sanitary board you know the job of the sanitary board was to forcibly clean the residential areas of the mining workers um, frequently uh, at at period set period intervals and uh you know which which was uh, you know if we look at it today it it's unimaginable it's very uh, you know the the indignity of it is uh, scary so uh, and which we have also seen in the story of bangalore like the setup of fraser town etc etc right so so the plague was once so their lives were really difficult so i and and because there was a huge population of depressed classes like you mentioned the influence of these social reform movements was huge the you know the workers when they organized for uh, even um, the trade union for example to fight for their uh, working conditions and wages etc the religion was a strong aspect of it because they were from depressed classes right so hence uh, the the you know for example i think uh, in janki nayar uh, writes that there was one film uh, uh, in tamil which represented uh, you know uh, which had a line in a song called paraya and uh, that film was only banned in kgf it was not banned in tamil nadu so uh, that's very interesting so the power of this movement in kgf was so huge that they could ban a film right so the influence was so much so uh, so i'm i would not be surprised if there was a connection between the cox town dud vihar and it was created like you said the station to and uh, cantonment i'm assuming the british had uh you know uh, they didn't want them to get down there <laughs> assuming so uh, probably that was the reason i mean we can only guess conspiratorial guess i guess yeah. but yeah yeah that might have been the reason i guess yeah yeah because it's always i've always wondered the distance between the two stations is hardly anything yeah yeah yeah, yeah 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 so it's so easy to access bangalore east from can so why would this right. small little station yeah yeah, yeah so another connection again which you know you dwelt upon and i just wanted to explore a little more was that um, when i see the b station on mg road the power station mm-hmm. i and in your presentation as well i mean you know we recognize that the story of kgf and bangalore story of electricity is yeah. again very closely entwined yeah, yeah. and um, when the cables went from here to uh, shivan samudra in 1902 it was a big moment for us and yeah. we 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 claim that space yeah. and that history today but while we recognize our heritage as predominantly you know cultural heritage or uh, architectural heritage where do you think that you know where is the space for acknowledging our industrial heritage its yeah. value its conservation even feeling a sense of loss for it seems to be yeah. missing you know we are losing so much even in in bangalore large industrial complexes which should be heritage spaces are being taken over for various other purposes um so i just wanted to know what you know how do we how do you think we see our industrial heritage yeah it's one of the most interesting things uh, i kept thinking about while making the film and also researching because uh, most of the kgf residents have so much pride uh about uh, you know their forefathers ancestors working in the mines and working really hard because it's it was tough to work in mines right and uh, you know extracting gold you know in the but there seems to be no remembrance right for these workers and which is unfortunate which is not true say in other countries right uh, or more developed countries so that is one aspect of you know remembering how do we remember the you know the industrial heritage or industrial history and then if you go to kgf it's hard to miss uh, the uh, the huge amount of equipment lying around the industrial equipment and in fact you know i was uh, you know a friend of mine a filmmaker friend was of mine was saying if david lynch saw this he would immediately make a film on it so it's so evocative right it's there you know it's like lying around and uh, untouched for so many years i mean uh, uh there is about i think more than 1000 kilometers of network tunnel network underground mm-hmm. uh, so and there are shafts going more than 3 km so which is a human feat right so what is heritage after all they are you know sort of memorializing human feats so 
so that also uh, and especially gold mining industry of kgf was the primary gold mining industry in india so uh, and uh, over 900 tons officially has been uh, extracted and uh, you know gold has been extracted from these mines so it's sad i i think that there should be a way to account for industrial heritage i know right now the way uh, our heritage is classified uh, and uh, you know uh, given heritage status is uh, not capable of uh, you know sort of managing industrial heritage as well but i think it's time we look at how industrial heritage can also be and we can also look at uh, uh, it as a tourism thing right so it's i mean uh, Uh, i think it was you who mentioned that you know or, or i read i think in australia and us mines are actually a uh, tourist spot because people go down all the way and uh, and who wouldn't want to go down 3 kilometers in dark tunnels and yeah i mean i was i felt so bad during the making that uh, we we can't go down anymore because it's all water uh, has filled the tunnels and shafts etc and it's not allowed because the mines are under litigation but uh, there is i think potential to look at uh, this the kgf place as uh, uh, as something which is industrial heritage and uh, create aspects to memorialize the workers who have worked there uh, and then uh, create some way of uh, you know uh, protecting the industrial heritage we, may, we need not protect all the mines which are there uh, in that 8 km 9 km stretch but we can at least reserve one mine as an example of great industrial achievements in, in 20th century india yeah yes absolutely in fact uh, yeah we did have this conversation and i was just thinking that um, a few years ago i took a road trip in california and uh, it was a travel story that i was doing and i plotted all the towns from san francisco in a loop that were connected to the gold rush and it's all on highway 49 and um, there are all along that that route um, there are towns and sites of significance that are connected to this uh, you know to the gold rush like i said so that's a very historic highway for them yeah yeah the story of the 49ers as they were called is celebrated in each of these towns yeah so you know there are museums um, telling you about where it began artifacts uh, information experiences yeah. that you can go through not just in maybe uh, the towns where the shafts were first sunk and the panning happened but every town on that highway that has significance right. yeah so uh, everything is presented with great pride in that story yeah uh, so i heard this question in your film which uh, you know says what keeps you in kgf and yeah. the answer was memories yeah so i want to know beyond the memories how do we um, how can we make these stories you know into potential for yeah. for us to to interact with the to be accessible uh, for people maybe as a museum or, yeah. or uh, experiences you know so have has anyone thought about it or how do you yeah. see that yeah i think i think many people who live in kgf and who are are are, are from kgf uh, think about it definitely i even had uh, i think in one revti who comes in my interview uh, and uh, and uh, she has been a kgf resident all her life and she in fact told me that you know why not do a museum right because it's uh, so many stories number one i mean kgf if you travel it's like uh, every person has a mining story to tell not only mining story like a story of their life which is which itself is very interesting uh, you know uh, which intersects religion work uh, recreation everything so that uh, i think there is a need to do uh, you know see the place as text like something that you also have worked on and and to set up a museum with a lot of oral history work which can be done i felt uh, a 35 minute film can never do justice to kola gold fields or even the work which has been done by janki before or some other writers like gayatri chandrashekar also uh, so that uh, i think there is a huge potential unfortunately i think culturally something is amiss in how we think of how we don't think of industry i think it's possibly also because we have so much of history thousands of thousands of years so we have too much to so people 
don't think something 1900 is heritage basically is is what i understood you know it's sort of and it's not a beautiful ornate monument it's industrial shaft for example so it's also those things culturally has to change for example i think uh, if you if somebody has watched chernobyl the series you know there was a small tribute to the miners who worked in that region at that time by including them in the series and how they helped uh, rescue people in chernobyl right so those kind of tributes uh, we don't see in our uh, movies or you know even television series or in you know sort of even i think geeta aramuruvan the journalist and writer wrote a novel on kgf it's called color of gold very interesting set in kgf that's probably the only fiction set in kgf but uh, if we know there's so many kgf stories it's a great place to uh, write a novel about or make a film about fictionally also right so these um, i think the discourse has to come in mainstream culture which hasn't happened so the attraction of that i mean there are, uh, there is hardly anyone who has lived in bangalore and has seen kgf at least i mean very uh, you know few people like ragu was telling us he himself hasn't seen <laughs> kgf yet right so there are so many uh, people who are aware of its history somewhat but have not visited it and i was also one of them before i started doing this work so uh, i think that the first step is to people have to go and see and it's a day trip away right in fact uh, you know people like you and me we should organize tours also i feel to for people to so. <laughs> go and, yeah yeah and yeah. more than anything you know even if it's not concentrated in a museum yeah you know, it's correct museum, yeah you know and each aspect of it from the social to the political yeah. Yeah. The infrastructure science it's all layers of storytelling that are possible yeah. in yeah. that one uh, location yeah in fact for students it's a great place to go study right uh, whether it's humanities or engineers uh, you know people from engineering background or studying engineering it's a great place to study uh, industrial history yeah natural history and then you know and the cultural part of it as well yeah anthropology i mean you know there are layers Correct. yeah one uh, small place um, like yeah. i often call bangalore you know a small town with big big history yeah the same you know with yeah. the kgf uh, okay. as is this the story is expand into such big big story yeah. and like i said they sadly untold yeah so, um one of the things i wanted to uh, bring up in the work that we do which is you know the memory maps project that i was talking to you about is about looking at locality memories and seeing how those memories are a tool to connect people to place so yeah. um we've done several of them across bangalore now and um, find that there are several um, what should i say challenges that happen in a city that's shifting as much as bangalore okay. yeah so you have a huge amount of uh, new residents coming in and then you have the old residents so there's a push back there is a gap that happens in that area a lot of the city is disappearing so i think one day people will think that we are a city with uh, a 30 year old history that's about it we've never existed before that yeah so where are, where the pockets of stories and the memories today are the only thing that we have to connect you know people to their environment where they live so i was wondering if um, if there is potential for kgf to have you know a uh, um, a mapping of of these stories. oh yeah 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 uh, yeah definitely i would think i mean something like what you do the memory mapping project is i mean kgf one because it's also just about uh, it's all concentrated in one specific stretch of land mm. so it's quite uh, easy to go and you know day, do a two three days of uh, you know memory mapping exercise with people there and anybody who you, you interview there will has a, has a story to tell and that itself is immense like we i remember we interviewed people uh, even in markets and uh, some uh, some people we met who are now uh, selling tea and breakfast in market were miners before uh, since they have lost the job etc they have you know because the mines have been closed since 2001 um, they are working in market and they are trying to find different uh, work uh, ways of earning money right earning a living so th- so many such jobs so many such uh, stories right so you find them everywhere in kg if it's really um, uh you know endless in a way right and uh, and i keep still keep going because it's it's just feels like it has just started 
uh, in many ways for me. And many people from KGF have a lot of, uh, it's very unlike I've seen of any other place. There is immense pride uh, when you say KGF, even to people who, uh, at, at different uh, uh, levels also. Like I met uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar, who used to, whose father was heading the mindset uh, in 1960s. His father was, I think, one of the first Indians to become the uh, chief of the mines there. And I went with him and he is, you know, almost 70 plus now, but he's like, he was, the moment he sat in car, he was jumping around, we are going to KGF, I'll tell you about this, I'll tell you about, you know, it was so amazing to sort of uh, see that enthusiasm, which we do, which in him, and there's equal enthusiasm you will see in someone who has uh, been part of the communist uh, discourse there, right? Uh, and he will tell you about the whole, the strikes, the, you know, the violence which happened because of the trade union fights, etc. So there is, you know, so much to unearth. It's almost overwhelming uh, for one person to do it, I feel. So there are different, like, uh, you know, histories. And there is also, you know, a, a car community of Marwadis who come from, uh, uh, you know, because of the mines, they came, they migrated from Rajasthan and set up shop here as money lenders. That itself is another sort of, uh, you know, aspect to think about uh, and you can interview, say, the Marwadi families who are still there and the Anglo-Indians, of course, uh, so many stories about their lives as well. So there is a lot to do in terms of memory mapping and I'm sure universities, uh, um, you know, have uh, provisions to do such programs and they should be and you also do it. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I very quickly, I know we're going to be opening up for Q&A soon, but I okay. wanted to ask you, so who do you think are the primary uh, or could be potential, not primary, but potential stakeholders for KGF in terms of storytelling and its historicity uh, in Bangalore? Stakeholders as an audience? Mm, no, maybe an audience as well, but also people who could, uh, you know, if we want to bring these stories to light, who are the people in Bangalore who could help, you know, with that process and invest emotionally and otherwise yeah. in KGF? Yeah, I mean, I, I think institutional, uh, institutionally, I can think of INTAC, for example, uh, mm -hmm. since they are, but I don't know if KGF has a separate chapter, I have not heard of it. Uh, so, but uh, INTAC is one organization, definitely. And I think the, the tourism ministry, which has been thinking of doing new things uh, recently. I've been hearing about them trying to do uh, something new uh, with the new government in place. Uh, uh, they also want to do something new. So this is a great thing and industrial, uh, it's a great opportunity for the state as well because industrial heritage wise, uh, nothing has been done in India much. So this could be, yes. a, you know, this could be the first, uh, you know, it could be a political, uh, what do you say, gain to do it as well. Yes. Uh, and it is the only gold mine in India. Correct. Yes. Yeah. It's a very I mean, there are smaller ones, but this is the only is. prominent one. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's, and I feel as an audience, uh, I mean, whoever has come to KGF with me, I even took the writer friend of mine, Zach once, and mm -hmm. we had a great time uh, trying to find uh, the, the old beer shop of Anderson Pate. Anderson Pate itself was called beer shop till it was renamed. So we wanted to find where it was. Uh, because Zach was very keen on that. So, yeah. and, and he went and I wrote a story on it, which became very popular. So, so like this, you know, I think people from all aspects, writers, artists need to engage, even visual artists. I think there is a lot for potential uh, for artists and cultural professionals to engage with KGF. And that will bring it into the main discourse, like I said. Um, yes. Because uh, apart from, of course, state doing its part. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much for this. Thank you. Um, Raghu, do you want to? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Alie and uh, Basav. Uh, we're going to ask uh, our attendees who posted questions in the Q&A box to uh, unmute themselves and uh, speak and ask the questions directly. Uh, and we're going to start with Siddharth Raja, who has um, a lot of questions for the both of you today. Uh, Siddharth, can you unmute yourself? and ask your questions. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Raghu. Thanks, Ali. Thanks, Pasam. It's been great to be on this presentation. I had three very specific questions which I wrote out and I don't have access to what I wrote, but I will say it from memory. Um, just like uh, the two divans in the 1920s managed to negotiate a reduction in the Mysore annual tribute as a result of a 
may uh, increase the rent payable for the assigned tract of bangalore was there any attempt to make a similar renegotiation in the rent for the gold fields that's question number 1 two um and this is a point that i've raised again is that K- kolar kgf is a great example of a planned city just outside bangalore and it could become the fulcrum of a good decentralized uh, urbanization but i think sadly the state government looks at it only as another land bank to plagiarize uh, to 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 steal from uh thoughts on that and lastly basav in your wonderful photographs you had i remembered that a few years ago the freemasons of bangalore had restored with the support of the freemasons in kolar the beautiful quaint freemasons hall in urgaon which exists oh, and i link on that thank you thank you siddharth uh, the the first question um, uh, i think i mentioned this slightly yes uh, what happened was initially only royalty of 5% was levied on the gold and uh, soon uh, i think it was mirza ismail uh, who was the diwan then who renegotiated and added uh, a gold duty was added and in fact an act was passed around it to calling it i think mysore gold duty act or something so uh, so there was uh, certainly that was done and that was of course didn't go down well with john teller and sons and in fact uh, you know by the time the mines uh, production goes down which is you know post 1920s uh, they started complaining that you know this is because you guys charged us unfair you know sort of uh, duty etc so uh, that did play out uh, and uh, mirza ismail was also instrumental in i mean one of the negotiation what do you say weapon for mirza ismail was also because he helped uh, uh, you know um, what do you say uh, quieten the workers in the 1930s after the 1930 strike it was a huge strike and uh, till then the british had not asked state to intervene or the john teller and sons had not asked the state to intervene in this workers movement affairs but then they asked mirza ismail to and he came to kgf he was the one who negotiated etc so uh, clearly he had some leverage uh, of that as well so yeah so uh, in a way uh, the our mysore divans had mm-hmm. ways to negotiate that to your second uh, point uh, which was what sorry about about how kgf could become the fulcrum of uh, oh yeah yeah, yeah. Right? the township right yeah township that's great but uh, one correction there is the, the problem with kgf right now is it's um, almost more than 12000 acres of land and it is all central government land so uh, and uh, since the closure which is 2001 the it's still under litigation the fight between um, the workers cooperative and the central government as to who should own it and if the mine should be and workers cooperative has been trying to make a case to reopen the mine saying that there is more potential i mean the mines were closed because you have to go deeper which is more dangerous physically uh, and then um, uh, the cost was not viable anymore because the grade of the ore was not as good as it was used to be before so they had to shut down in 2001 because there were decades of losses of the psu but now um, the workers cooperative has been saying no there is more potential we need to you know sort of if the state doesn't want to revive the mines let them sell it to someone else let them open a tender and call for uh, you know applications from mining companies from world over right and that is the drama which has been playing out which is one of the reasons why the land is still stuck and one of the reasons why the heritage is still in place i would say the like you said the moment it opens up as a real estate hub we don't know what is going to happen um and state government has made case to get, uh, in parliament when i think the earlier mp was there to uh, ask the land to be handed over to karnataka state but that has not happened either so it's still central government land essentially but you're right the township example is great and i think we also had township examples in bangalore itself like fraser town and the townships which were built later mm. uh, in the early 20th century so uh i don't know i mean the unfortunate part is that the planning town planning and this is now directly related to how much uh, money can be made out of it so it's a very complicated question i guess yeah um thank you for that uh, siddharth and thank you basav uh, aditya sondhi would you like to ask your question next 
Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Raghu. Thanks for that interesting conversation. Ali, I mentioned the connections between KGF and Bangalore and the uh, William Richards High School yeah. was in fact set up by Bill Richards, who's a Bangalorean. Uh, Ali probably knows him. I was wondering if that school is still around and how is it faring? The school is still around. Uh, the building is the same. Uh, it is faring as well as it can in the current conditions, I would guess, because there has been a lot of migration out of KGF as well. Um, so the people who had the means uh, to migrate have migrated because, of course, there is no more uh, sort of jobs or employment available in KGF. So many people who, uh, I mean, most, many, much of the population which can migrate has migrated. So, uh, but the school is still there and still thriving, I would say, except that the building is, needs probably some work. Sure. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Pooja Nayak next. Uh, Pooja, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, hi, Pasav and Ali. Thanks really very much for this rich conversation. Uh, I really like some of the themes that you all have been bringing up in your talk. And I just had a couple of questions. One was if you could speak a little bit about what the main livelihood in KGF is after the mining has been stopped. And the conversation that you all were having about the very important aspect of industrial heritage that, you know, we don't often recognize that industrial sort of events and yeah. labor is such an important part of life uh, for a huge part of the subcontinent. And is there a way to think of appreciating industrial heritage in a way that's not just for the tourist, but also like I think Ali was suggesting stakeholders, thinking of them more actively. How, how could we think of industrial heritage outside of just, you know, tourism? Thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, sorry, what was the first question? I've been, we've been there two oh, questions. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the first question was, what is the main livelihood? Oh, livelihood, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a great question. And that's the sad story, I think, in a way, because in the sense that there is no real employment in KGF today. So one of the... Um, Thanks to the railway line, which was set up uh, by the mining companies back then, the number of trains to between KGF and Bangalore are a lot during the day, I think about six to, uh, every day. So um, that has become the means. So people actually come to K Bangalore every morning and uh, for work and return in the evening because it's um, hardly a two hour train ride. Um, so Essentially, there is no employment in KGF, opportunities-wise. So most of them come to Bangalore for work, which has been... So that's why in the lockdown, there was a big issue because the trains were stopped uh, in Kola Gold Fields because the people couldn't get any work there because their work is here. And so many of them come for daily wage work here as well. Yeah, and that's the unfortunate part. The heritage part, I think we spoke at... Uh, we discussed it a little bit, uh, uh, I guess, making a museum, creating a museum. And I think, first of all, people need to visit it in my mind. So once people start visiting, the potential will be seen by the authorities concerned as well. Uh, Aliyah, you want to add to that? Yes, I think that while, you know, um, all these um, uh, options are really uh, wonderful to surface, you know, the stories. It's also for me a matter of caution because I would be very reluctant to objectify. I think the primary, the primary stakeholders are the people of KGF itself yeah. and pride of place is extremely important. So objectifying, commodifying in some manner is a very fine line for yeah. me, but to sensitize, I think more, you know, people to, to, the, to the value of the place is a good place uh, to start. Yeah. And I think just to add one point is, I think what we miss in our education today, more at least the privileged ones who get to study something else uh, beyond just India, is that we don't learn about the stories of our own, uh, especially in today's climate when the, uh, uh, the public enterprises are uh, on their last leg, most of them, and yes. privatization is in vogue. Uh, so I think it's a it's uh, imperative that many of us who can should go and study how these uh, PSUs fared and what made them decline, what was the reasons why they are what they are uh, and why they are being uh, you know, offered to private companies today 
Uh, so I think that's a gold mine can be one, but there can any like BSNL also. So any enterprise I think should be studied. Uh, and for, I think by management schools also, uh, it's a great, yes. that could be a good thing also. Yeah. Yes, because the public sector was a culture at one yeah. point. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's, there are lots of uh, comments on uh, this session and the need to create an industrial museum and recognize uh, the many um, innovations uh, in design and uh, and what uh, the Kola Goldfields contributed. Uh, there's an interesting question from uh, Mr. Um, yeah, I think I read his question and I think, yeah, so the Supreme Court judgment, so it's uh, when the mines closed in 2001, um, the workers uh, quickly uh, got together and uh, they applied for revival because there was, uh, um, they were not happy with the compensation which was offered as part of the uh, retrenchment of all the workers. There were about 3000 workers, I think, at the time of the closer. So, uh, they formed a cooperative and they fought the case against uh, uh, the government of India and Supreme Court. Yeah, by 2013 is when the, uh, you know, the lease of the land to BGML ends, basically. So now the land is not BGMLs essentially on paper, it is central government's land and the BGML, the public enterprise does not have ownership of the land anymore on paper. Uh, and Supreme Court has ruled that their tender should be opened up by the government for uh, to river and see if there is interest to revive mines from elsewhere from different companies etc that is the current status and that's as far as 2013 since then uh, i did go and speak to bgml uh, officials uh, during making of the film um, and uh, the bgml officials uh, say that government is preparing their uh, proposal uh, and it's taking time essentially so yeah, so it's been, since 2013, the tender document has not been prepared, uh, has been opened up basically, yeah. So uh, it's in a limbo, essentially, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Basav, and thank you for that uh, question, Mr. Rafiq. Uh, we have Satya uh, Jyoti Nagaram, who has a comment and a question. Hey, Basav, sorry, uh, I joined this, uh, uh, this session rather, uh, almost halfway through, but I found it uh, fascinating having grown up in KGF and having uh, studied at uh, uh, KGF school and uh, first grade college there. Uh, our family has a long connection with the mines. Uh, we are more like a, four, a fourth generation or fifth generation in KGF. Wow. And um, we have a lot of uh, business connections with the uh, gold mines going from John Taylor and Sons and all the way down to BGML. And, uh, but I will certainly look at the, uh, the film that you made. Uh, but one of my comments was that, you know, we have a lot of photographic material associated with John Taylor and Sons and with BGML that my grandfather, uh, Mr. J.D. Gopal Krishnan had, uh, had collected. And uh, so I would like some contact information with you since if you've been traveling to KGF, yeah. my father still lives in yeah. KGF with the Govindram and, and he may be able to contribute. Somebody else had made a comment that there are some of the uh, uh, managers who worked at BGML who are still living in Bangalore in their 90s, yeah. and they would be a good resource for you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I'm and sure. uh, yeah, I would pass. I will pass on the contact. My contact through. Uh, I hope Raghu will have. Yeah, I, I will um, send the email. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, and you're so lucky to be associated with KGF. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we've nearly run out of time. So before closing comments, uh, last question from Indu Krishnan. Uh, this is for Basav. Um, what drew you to make this film? Hi, Indu. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think I, when I saw KGF, it just visually is, uh, was very striking. I think, I mean, like you can stand on the road there and uh, hardly vehicles going by and suddenly it's very green environmentally and it's in you know, the climate is really good and there are these uh, uh, huge equipment lying around rusting uh, and open shafts in some cases where you can people can probably fall down through with no security some of the shafts so uh, it was visually striking as a, as a filmmaker you would know and I just couldn't resist uh, uh, thinking of making a film of, out of it and luckily Serpedia offered uh, some 
support, uh, financial support for the film, and that was really helpful. Um, yeah, but I would have liked to. Uh, and Janki Nair also had a made a film, I think, in nineties when the mines were there. I wish that her film was uh, digitized or something. Uh, hopefully, she will in coming years. And that is also a very interesting film. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a filmmaker's goldmine. If you visit, you will also make one Hindu. Yeah, yeah. I think the, someone asked about Hutti gold mines. I'll just answer that. Yeah. Sorry, Abu. Shankar asked. Yeah. So uh, hi, Shankar. Uh, the, the uh, they are not connected, but Hutti Gold Mines is itself uh, another gold mine near Raichu. But the output is really low uh, and uh, it's a state property, not the central government property, if you want to differentiate. Between it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ali and Basar, for the important work that you, you do, both of you do, and for leading us tonight through a forgotten world almost. Um, coming up later this month is the second part of the KGF files revolving around the, the uh, emigration of Cornish miners from England to Kolar. From Cornwall, yeah. That yes. would be amazing too. Yeah, I think they, they, they have done a lot of uh, work and research around the music in KGF as well yes. of that time. Yeah, yes. there's a website, I think. Yeah, thank you, BIC, for allowing me uh, and Alie to uh, have this conversation. Yes, and sharing thank my work. you. Yeah. It's been our honor and pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in, everyone. And uh, thank you again, Ali and Basav. See you all soon. Good night. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.